After completing Chapter 4, you gain access to the Outrealm Gate, where you can access the game's paid DLC. And so, this calls for yet another bonus episode. Many people have been asking what I plan to do regarding the DLC in this game, if I'm going to actually do it as part of the main playthrough or not. Well, here's the thing. I'm actually not going to do it as part of this main playthrough, and the main reason is, DLC adds a huge amount of extra maps and content to the game. Because of this, doing these maps alongside the main story tends to make you quite overleveled. And, okay, let me just explain this. During my first playthrough of the game, I did DLC pretty much as it came out. Because of this, my characters got so overleveled that I actually quit playing the game because it became too easy. I'm really trying to avoid that happening here, and because of that, I'm going to be avoiding DLC during uh, the main playthrough. However, I plan to cover every single DLC map eventually, but as a separate series that will happen after the main playthrough has concluded. However, there will be a few exceptions. There is exactly one set of DLC maps that is pretty relevant to the main story of the game. I will be covering this set right at the end. There is also one more DLC map that I actually want to do as well during this playthrough, because it also kind of relates to the main storyline. Not really directly, but it does have some interesting implications that I definitely want to discuss, because it's quite interesting from the perspective of this game's backstory. But my other goal in not showing DLC during the main run is that I want to show that this game is complete and enjoyable as an experience on its own right without buying any of the downloadable content. That's what I want to show, so hopefully I can do that. But I will be taking this episode to discuss exactly what DLC for Fire Emblem Awakening is and how it works. So, DLC, or paid downloadable content, is the other form of downloadable extra content in Fire Emblem Awakening. The first being Spot Pass Battles, which I already showed. That is completely free, you don't need to pay for that at all, and already that adds a lot of content. But if you're someone who wants even more out of this game than it already... I mean, this game's massive as it is, but if you want even more, then this DLC is for you. Fire Emblem Awakening was Nintendo's first attempt at paid DLC in any of their games. At least that's what all the sources tell me. And this really set the bar. This pretty much told everyone that Nintendo is one of the few companies out there that does paid DLC right. DLC gets a very bad rap these days because usually people consider it either cosmetic stuff that doesn't affect anything, stuff that affects the game too much, and thus you're basically paying to win, or stuff that was deliberately left out of the main game in order to make more money. It seems like this reputation was actually very much known by the developers of Fire Emblem Awakening. If you read the Iwata Asks video, you'll see that the developers of this game actually very consciously tried to avoid making this game so that, and this is a direct quote, so as not to fall under criticism that the game is lacking unless you buy the extra content. Another developer here says, Well, there would be a concern that some might wonder if the game content was a little thin without buying the additional content, so a big assumption was that we had to make the main game solid. Yes, DLC was actually only decided on very late into the game's development, and by that point, again, to directly quote the developers in an interview, the main story was already completely finalised, they couldn't take out or change anything. In fact, the addition of DLC actually spurred them on to make sure that the main game was as complete as possible, so you didn't need to feel like you had to buy the DLC to get a more complete experience. Honestly, this was actually really amazing, because they managed to make it so that the DLC is entirely optional. It's not necessary to further enjoy the game, and the game itself is a fully complete package without it. However, it's not trivial either. The DLC adds a huge amount to the game, and they struck a good balance between adding enough while, again, making sure that the game is still already complete. Think of it as more like an expansion pack on an already complete game. 
Now, regardless as well, none of the DLC has any influence on the main story. All of it is entirely side story chapters that features Krom and company visiting parallel universes, so it's pretty much totally unrelated to the main game. But it is a few extra fun maps. And quite a few extra difficulty challenges too. Now of course, there are some direct rewards out of DLC as well, and I'll be discussing that later. But firstly, let's talk about how DLC works, and for that, I'm going to go to video footage as a visual aid. Here is the Outrealm Gate on the world map of Fire Emblem Awakening. This is accessible right after you beat Chapter 4, Two Falchons. If we go and enter, we'll be taken to a screen with Anna here, and we have three options. We can either play a map that we've already purchased, purchase new maps, or exit. When you go to play a map here, you'll see a list of every map that you've purchased here. Now, the records are blank, and I'll tell you what that means in a bit. Once you purchase a DLC map, there are two things that you'll need to remember. One, the map will be playable across all of your game files. So, the reason my record is blank there is because this file that I have, the file I'm using for the playthrough I'm recording, has not played any of the DLC yet, and thus has no records listed. But I have played all this DLC on my other files, so... Basically, once you buy DLC once, you have access to that DLC on any file you ever make in the future, so pretty good value that. Speaking of good value, once you've purchased a DLC map, you can actually repeat it as many times as you want. Because of this, they are very, very good for grinding once you've beaten the main storyline, so bear that in mind. I mean, you can still grind without DLC, but just DLC makes it easier. So, we can check a map here and we get the option to play it. Now, I won't exactly show playing it right here because that would launch us into an actual battle, but basically, just take my word for it, you can play these as many times as you want. And for the maps that give you actual rewards, you'll need to play them multiple times if you want to obtain multiple copies of that reward. So that's basically how playing a map works. Now, if we go to purchase maps, and I might just cut the video here, on the bottom screen here, once you go into the Purchase Map option, you'll see a list of every single map that's available, including the ones that you've purchased and downloaded already. This is basically where every map um, you see here. You can add funds directly to your eShop account from here, or you can use funds that you already have. On the top screen, you see a brief description of the DLC map, a brief indicator of its difficulty, how many blocks you need to uh, download it, and the original release date of the map. So the first DLC was released pretty much on the date of this game's release, and the last DLC that was made available was released um, on that date. So they spanned... Um, pretty much a few months, basically. Now, one thing that's unique to the non-Japanese versions of the game is these packs. These packs allow you to purchase all three maps in a particular set of DLC for a discounted price, as in you'll pay less than you would if you downloaded all three individually. These are very good value if you plan on getting all the DLC maps, but something that I should point out. Notice how these ones are segregated, as in Champions of your 1, 2, and 3. You don't actually need uh, the earlier ones in order to play a later one. So, say you only wanted to play Champions of Your 3. You could simply purchase that map individually, download it, and it would work without needing Champions of Your 1 and 2. So, you actually don't need to get every single DLC map in a pack if you don't want them. So... You can pretty much just pick and choose the ones you want. But if you do want to get all the maps in a particular pack, it is recommended that you buy them as a pack, because that will cost less. Now, again, this feature was added to the American and European versions. In the Japanese version of the game, you had to buy every single DLC map individually. Sometimes by completing DLC maps, you'll be rewarded with characters from past games. So here we get the chance to recruit Prince Marth, who will be added to the Avatar logbook even if we say no. Now, as for how these characters work... I'll just show you. 
where, if I can just find him, where is he? There he is. Prince Marth there. Prince Marth here is essentially the exact same as a Spot Pass character. He just has unique artwork that's been done specifically for the DLC. Marth in particular has a unique class, Lodestar, which um, is kind of an interesting um, backpedaling on a translation issue, but uh, don't really have time to talk about that here. He also comes with the Aptitude skill though, which normally only Donald can get, so some of the DLC characters do actually have unique skills, but again, they are essentially spot pass characters to all intents and purposes. They still can't support or really do anything like that, so there's no real harm in not getting them at all. Speaking of spot pass characters though, there are some kind of interesting interactions here. DLC characters are considered totally separate characters to spot pass ones. For this reason... It's possible to do some pretty hilarious things. Here's my Marth. And here's their Marth. Yes, we can actually have these two Marths fight each other. But it gets even stranger than that. DLC characters are counted as completely separate to Spot Pass characters, which means here's Prince Marth, here's other Prince Marth, and here's King Marth. Yes, three Marths in one army. This is completely possible. You'll find any DLC characters that you've obtained in your avatar logbook, where you can pay gold to summon them again at any time. Something that you might be wondering... Does permanent death apply to DLC characters? Well, yes and no. Yes, if a DLC character dies in battle, they are gone from your army. However, you can summon them again from the logbook, or re-recruit them by simply completing the DLC chapter associated with them again. But, if you do re-recruit them via DLC, they'll be treated as completely new characters, and as such, will be reset to their starting levels and skills and classes, whatever. They'll basically be completely reset, so if you make any progress leveling these characters up, you probably want to save it to your avatar logbook, because otherwise, if they die, you lose all of that. So that's basically how DLC characters and maps work. But what about the item rewards that you obtain from DLC maps? Well, these are kind of interesting. Firstly, there are eight DLC exclusive skills. Out of these, four of them are, are learnt from classes that you access through DLC exclusive items, so there are two DLC exclusive classes which I'll talk about later. The remaining four are learned from skill scrolls that you gain through the DLC maps. Now, all four of these skills are thus exclusive to the DLC, so you need to actually download the DLC in order to get these skills. However, you might be asking, what happens if I use a character with DLC skills or classes in a Street Pass team? What do the other players see if they haven't bought the DLC? Well, actually, characters with DLC classes or skills are perfectly compatible with normal, non-DLC downloaded games on Street Pass teams. However, players without the DLC installed will see OutRealm skill, that question mark skill icon. That will dis be displayed for every DLC exclusive skill on a character. However, the skills, I'm pretty sure they still work. As for DLC exclusive characters, basically they'll still be used, but their portraits will be a giant question mark to anyone who doesn't have the DLC, since those portraits are normally within the game's data. The really interesting thing, though, is what DLC classes look like to people who don't have DLC installed. The actual result is kind of interesting. They still work perfectly fine, they have the same stat caps and weapon specialties as they do normally, but to people who don't have the DLC installed, in battle, they will use generic tactician models, but wielding the weapons that that class normally uses. I'm not going to show it here because I don't want to rip off someone else's video because I don't actually have footage of this, but... 
If you are interested to see what DLC exclusive classes look like to players who don't have DLC installed, I'll link you a video that another user on YouTube who covers Fire Emblem Awakening, Shadow of Chaos, has already done. It's actually pretty interesting that they took this into account. Speaking of DLC classes, I'll just briefly mention them now. There are two classes that are exclusive to DLC. Any character can promote to these classes when they're above level 10 and, although I don't even know if they have to be above level 10, they have to use one of these two items, the Dread Scroll or the Bride's Bouquet. These classes are gender exclusive, so males get one and females get the other, and each of these classes learns two skills each. These classes are also somewhat unique in how they work. They have the stat caps uh, equivalent to a promoted class, however, they gain experience at the rate of a base class. Also, they can reach a maximum level of 30 rather than 20, like special classes such as Manakee, Targwell, or Villager. So, these classes are very, very strange in how they work. Let's see them in action, though. Making its first appearance since the second Fire Emblem game, Gaiden, the Dreadfighter class is male exclusive and uses swords, axes, and magic tomes. Its stats specialize heavily in resistance, but has a quite a good balance all around. Completely new to this game, the Bride class is exclusive to females and uses lances, bows, and staves. It has quite a good balance of stats all around. The Dreadfighter's class skills are Resistance plus 10, a pretty massive boost by the uh, normal standards of stat boosting skills, and Aggressor, which gives plus 10 to your flat attack power rating. That's not strength or weapon might or anything, it's plus 10 to your actual base damage during the player phase. It's probably the best male exclusive skill in the game, which is kind of annoying because it's DLC exclusive. The Bride class's skills are Rally Heart, which is a rally skill that boosts all stats of any units in a 3-tile radius by 2, and movement by 1, which makes it one of the best rally skills in the game. Uh, don't mind the lands clipping through the dress there. That's a weird thing about the animations of this class sometimes. Its second skill is Bond, which restores 10 HP to all allies within a 3-tile radius. A quick note about DLC exclusive skills, both those learned from the DLC classes and those that are standalones. Something very important you need to keep in mind. DLC exclusive skills can never be passed down to the second generation children. These skills are always ignored for the purposes of inheritance. Now, second generation characters can get these skills, but they have to learn them either by using the DLC item to learn the skill, or by reclassing to the DLC exclusive class and learning the skill from there. So basically that means, say you have a male character who's learned Aggressor, and you'd really love it if you could pass Aggressor down to their children. No, you can't. DLC exclusive skills cannot be inherited by children characters. Again, children characters can get them, but they have to work for them. They can't inherit them from their parents. So, We've shown the DLC exclusive classes and skills, and given a brief indicator of how DLC characters work, and how purchasing the maps actually works. I'll close this video off by giving a brief description of every single DLC map that's available for this game. I'll be listing these in order of release, but that's a bit of a moot point because at the time this video has been made, every DLC for this game is available, and will be available until Nintendo shuts down its Wi-Fi servers, which hopefully won't be for a very, very long time. In the Japanese version, DLC was split into two series, Series 1 and Series 2. Series 2, I don't think the developers even anticipated it would exist because... Yeah, they had no idea how popular it would be. They just made Series 2 on a whim, and the announcement kind of came completely out of nowhere. But firstly, Series 1. Most of the Series 1 maps focus on Einheria, or Spirit Talismans. These are cards that summon the spirits of heroes from past Fire Emblem games. Most of the battles are fought between armies of Einheria, 
In other words, think Ultimate Showdown of Ultimate Destiny, but for Fire Emblem, basically. These maps kind of have little in the way of plot, but it is really interesting to see these past characters react to the characters from Awakening, and even just see how the personalities of some of the Japan-only characters have been localized. Series 1 begins with Champions of Yore, the first ever DLC made available for this game, and pretty much just a taster of what's to come for the rest of it. The opponents you face in these missions are the lowest level of any DLC, which means it's definitely appropriate for an early game party, though the final one of this set can be a little difficult by early game standards. These missions consist of going up against the heroes and heroines of previous Fire Emblem games, basically the main male and the main female characters, and in the last mission you go up against all of them at once. The DLC characters you get from this are Marth from the first game, Roy from the second game, which hilariously means that yes, finally, Marth and Roy are in the same Fire Emblem game, and Micaiah from the tenth game. She's recruited from the final mission in this. The final one also gives you the All Stats Plus 2 manual, which teaches the All Stats Plus 2 skill. Every one of these DLC maps is played on a remastered version of a map from a previous Fire Emblem game. The one used for this set is Chapter 1 from FE1, FE3, and Shadow Dragon, Talus Island. The next set in Series 1 is Lost Bloodlines. This one takes place on a remastered version of the prologue chapter from Genealogy of the Holy War, and consists of a battle between the characters from Arcania, so that's Fire Emblem 1 and 3, versus the characters from Yggdral, that is Fire Emblem 4 and 5. Oh yes, uh, the Arcania characters also include Gaiden characters, the ones from Fire Emblem 2. The DLC characters that you recruit from this are Leif from the first map, Alm, uh, who... Leif was from Fire Emblem 5, Alm from Fire Emblem 2, from the second map, and this also gives you the Dreadfighter scroll, and Salif, the main character of Fire Emblem 4's second generation, from the third map, and that also gives you the Paragon skill manual, which doubles all experience a character gains. Definitely useful for grinding. The levels here range from 16 unpromoted to 5 promoted, so it's a bit of a step up in difficulty from the previous one, but it shouldn't be too hard. The next map set in this series is Smash Brethren. Now, this might seem like a... well, it, I mean, it is a Smash Brothers reference. The English version completely turned this into a Smash Brothers reference, and a reference to the fandom rivalry between Roy and Ike in uh, the Smash Brothers series. This was not the case in the Japanese version, though. The Japanese version just had this set called Red vs. Blue. This is a battle between the characters from Elim, so Fire Emblem 6, 7, and actually 8 as well, which kind of implies that Sacred Stones takes place in the same universe as Elim, just on a different continent versus the characters from Tellius, so Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. The characters recruited here are Elincia from Path of Radiance from the first map, Erica from Sacred Stones from the second map, and this also gives you access to the Wedding Bouquet to promote characters to the Bride class, and Lin from Fire Emblem 7 Blazing Sword from the third map, which also gives you the IoT Shields skill manual, which teaches a skill that negates the weaknesses of flying classes. The recommended level for this map is promoted at level 3 to 10. It's a definitely a step up from the last one, but not too much. These battles all take place on a remastered version of the final chapter map from Blazing Sword. The grand finale of the Einheria series is Rogues and Redeemers. This takes place on the, a remastered version of Chapter 8 from Path of Radiance, and consists of an army of basically heroes versus an army of villains with a small army of kind of neutral wildcard characters who fight on either side. The characters recruited here are Ephraim from Fire Emblem 8, Sacred Stones from the first map. He actually has a pretty unique skill as well, so he's one of the more important DLC characters. Celica from Fire Emblem 2 from the second map, and Ike himself from Path of Radiance from the final map, which also gives you the Limit Breaker skill manual. This teaches a skill that raises the maximum stats in everything by 10. You may think that's kind of broken, but trust me, if you're going for the later DLC maps, you will need this. The enemies in these maps are all promoted and at level 20, so recommended for late game parties only. But there was one set of maps released in Series 1 that didn't actually fit this theme. This is the Golden Pack. These maps are, well, they each serve one specific purpose. 
The first one, the Golden Gaff, is basically all about grinding for gold. You have access to a huge number of enemies, all of which are carrying gold, but they'll all try and escape the map, and most of them have the pass skill, so actually getting the gold off of them isn't easy. And as you can see by that screenshot, some of the enemies here are pretty powerful, so you can only realistically get a lot of gold out of this map if you're very high leveled. Speaking of high leveled, the second one is pretty much made just for doing that. It's Exponential Growth, which provides you uh, a map full of entombed special risen that give enormous amounts of experience for killing them. They're basically Fire Emblem's equivalent of Ordino from the Pokemon series. However, these enemies have very high HP and while they won't attack you, the very high level ones, in other words the ones that give the most experience, have counter and a lot of decent skills. So be very careful because characters dying here is a very real possibility if you're stupid. Also note that this map is only good for grinding lower leveled characters. Once your characters get high leveled, it's actually more effective to grind them on Lost Bloodlines 3 than it is in Exponential Growth, simply because there are just more enemies in Lost Bloodlines 3. The last of the Golden Pack is Infinite Regalia, which gives you access to an unlimited number of treasure chests containing legendary weapons. Sounds good, right? Well, there has to be a catch. Yes, there is. This map is also populated with 36 extremely super powerful enemies that all carry legendary weapons themselves, so... You can get these legendary weapons, but you'll pretty much need an endgame party to do it, because these enemies are very, very tough, and it can be quite a challenge. This map is also somewhat interesting, because it does have some interesting implications for the storyline. And that's why I actually will be doing this one, but after the main story is over. They certainly make grinding for gold, experience, and weapons very easy, especially on Lunatic Mode, where they're pretty much the only reliable way to grind. But I'm kind of fine with this because these are actual battles that you have to play, so unlike a lot of other games where you can just pay money to level up or things like that, in this one, you have to at least work for your experience and gold, so I do kind of like that. Oh, uh, the game doesn't tell you this, but Infinite Regalia also gives you access to a DLC character, Elder Gun from Fire Emblem 4. Although, he doesn't have a unique portrait, so he just reuses his trading card game artwork. It also gives you the silver card, which halves the cost of items in shops. So, that's the end of Series 1. Now, the American version had no... pretty much no distinction between Series 1 and Series 2. They moved on to the second series very quickly. The European version, however, was kind of interesting, because they released some of these maps out of sequence, and I'll talk about that more later. But first, on to Series 2, called Path of a Grandmaster in the Japanese version. The first of these sets of maps is the Challenge Pack. These maps are designed for expert players who have already grinded up all their characters to max level and are thinking, hey, this game's too easy! Well, think again. These maps are specifically designed to be a major challenge. The first one, Death's Embrace, has the entire map covered in death spikes that reduce your characters to 1 HP at the start of every turn. Yeah. The second one, Five Anna Firefight, has you rescuing five Annas from a huge horde of flying enemies in the middle of a volcano with the rescue staff not usable. Good luck with that. The third one, Roster Rescue, has you chasing down giant Risen that are trying to flee the map with vital information. Chasing them is easier said than done, because not only do they have very high movement and a lot of good movement boosting skills, but the map consists of passageways that constantly open and close themselves. Each of these three maps also has a special condition, which if you fulfill it, you'll recruit the associated DLC character. In this case, the three Pegasus Knight sisters from Marth's games, Est, Catria, and Pala. So, unlike the other DLC characters, you actually have to fulfill specific conditions to recruit these ones. So this map series is recommended for those who... yeah, those who want a serious challenge. Designed to appeal to the complete opposite half of the fandom, though, is the Scramble series. These maps are deliberately made to be very low in difficulty overall. What they do have in abundance, though, is conversations between characters. It's almost amazing how many extra conversations they wrote for this. There is almost, I mean, maybe even around 800 new conversations in these three maps. 
and they're often between characters who weren't compatible supports in the main game, so if you want to see characters interact with each other who didn't interact during the main story, this is the map pack for you. The first map is Harvest Scramble, which is set around a harvest festival. The second is Summer Scramble, which is set on a beach, and contains swimsuit fan service scenes for the four characters voted the most popular in the first generation by Japanese players. Just take note of that. They're actually follow the, following the Japanese popularity polls, not the English ones. And the third map is set in a hot spring and contains uh, Yukata, or Kimono fan service, for the four most popular characters of the second generation. Now, these characters who get fan service scenes, if your avatar is married to any one of them, they get special conversations, which is kind of cool. But these characters all get special conversations even without that. Something also to note, these maps are, in fact, I think it's only Hot Spring Scramble. It's the only time that the Spot Pass parallel characters, as in the ones who are full playable characters but only get support for the avatar, this is the only time they actually get to talk to other people, so definitely recommend it if you want some more character development for the Spot Pass parallel characters who were otherwise severely lacking in that regard. Remember how I said I'd talk about the European version's release schedule at some point? Well, here's where that comes in. In the European version, Harvest Scramble was actually one of the first DLC maps released. And I actually think this makes a lot of sense personally, since it's a very low difficulty map and definitely suitable for an early game party. Though the European version did have some other weird things regarding the order though, for some reason, they got Rogues and Redeemers before Smash Brethren or Lost Bloodlines. In fact, Lost Bloodlines was delayed in Europe so much that European fans were worried that it wouldn't even be released there. The third pack in this series, I can't actually talk about now. Suffice to say, simply stating the basic premise of this set of three maps is an enormous spoiler for the point that I'm currently at in the playthrough, and, and because of that, I am not even going to talk about this set at all. But, just to say one thing, if you are taking on these maps, you want to have all of the first generation parents married, and preferably at maximum stats. That's the only thing that I'll say so far, but don't worry, we will be seeing more of these maps later. This is the one set that I do plan to cover during the main playthrough, because it actually is kind of plot relevant. And finally, we have Apotheosis, the grand finale of all the DLC released for this game. And oh boy, did they pull out all the stops for this one. This is basically the, thought lunatic mode was too easy? Well, we've got a map for you! Look very closely at the stats of that Berserker there. Your eyes aren't deceiving you. Yes, he has 80 strength. The maximum was normally 50, by the way. 99 HP, stats above the maximum stat caps, even with Limit Breaker. Also, those skills. He has Counter, but he also has three Lunatic Plus exclusive skills. Hawkeye, which makes all of his attacks hit. Paviz Plus, which automatically halves the damage of any uh, sword, axe, or lance attack that he takes. Luna Plus, which makes all of his attacks ignore your defense. And Dragon Skin, which makes all of your attacks do half damage and makes him immune to instant death. And guess what? This isn't even a boss. This is what the basic enemies look like in this chapter. And you have to get through five waves of them. Yeah. You're going to need max stats, excellent skill setups, and a lot of rallying to get through these enemies. And even then, if you can defeat the enemies fast enough, you just might have a chance to face this game's ultimate boss. And trust me when I say, they're insane. If you somehow manage to get through this insanity without having a heart attack, you'll recruit Katarina the final DLC character originating from Fire Emblem 12, New Mystery of the Emblem. She starts out in the Tactician class, which is unique, but she also has the Shadow Gift skill, which allows her to use Dark Magic in classes that aren't Dark Mage or Sorcerer. So, she's actually quite a useful character to have. The problem is, by the time you do get her, there's really nothing else to do in the game. 
If you manage to defeat the super, super, super ultimate boss, though, you'll be given a supreme emblem, an item that sells for an enormous amount of gold. Again, I don't know if you'd really need gold if you're actually able to do this, because this is pretty much the last thing you're ever meant to do in the game, so by the time you've done this, there's not much else to do with Awakening, but if you can conquer this chapter, you can officially consider yourself an Awakening Master. So that's it for this discussion on DLC. We'll be back for the playthrough shortly, but for the time being, just note that I'll be covering the DLC later, but this game definitely has some of the best by far on any system. And if you really like this game, I would recommend checking some of it out. 